Welcome everyone to the online lecture series titled Cultural Cooperation with China, Opportunities, Challenges, Red Lines. Welcome also on behalf of IFA, Germany's Institute for Foreign Cultural Relations and Stiftung Mercator. In this lecture series, we focus on cultural cooperation with China and the trends and developments affecting actors from academia and practice in Germany, China and beyond. The series of online events has been designed by IFA and is funded by Stiftung Mercator. So maybe a few words about them up front. IFA promotes a peaceful and enriching coexistence between people and cultures worldwide. IFA supports artistic and cultural exchange and exhibition, dialogue and conference programs, and it acts as a center of excellence for international cultural relations. In the field of dialogue and research, IFA has for several years included dialogue with Chinese partners on the foundation of cultural exchange. Through international understanding, Stiftung Mercator seeks to bring about a functioning relations between Germany, the EU, and countries of particular importance to Europe, among them China, of course. An example for this is the student exchange program with China, which has been supported by the foundation since 1998. A sign of the sustained commitment to German-Chinese relations, the foundation also operates a representative office in Beijing since the mid 2010s. IFA and Stiftung Mercator have also been working together since 2016 on various aspects of the topic uh, or surrounding the topic of cultural education in the German-Chinese context. Cooperation in culture and science is an important pillar of bilateral relations with China. So the need for good practice in this area, as well as more complex understanding of its various contexts is especially important in view of the strong interconnectedness of our, of our societies, as well as China's increased international weight, even outside of traditional areas such as the economy. However, in recent years, exchange and cooperation have faced major challenges, especially in the cultural and scientific field such as the severe restrictions on personal encounters as a result of the COVID pandemic, as well as other hurdles that have occurred in the last few years. However, we will learn more about that today and how to deal with it. And today we have the third of three online meetings. But before we start, I'd also like to uh, introduce myself briefly so that you know who's guiding you through the next one and a half hours. My name is Sabrina Weidmann. I'm a professor at the University of Applied Sciences in Aschaffenburg. I studied Sinology at the University of Würzburg and also received my doctoral degree there. I also founded the China Log Plot platform that seeks to encourage a network between people who engage with China or are simply curious about China. But today I'm here as the, in the role of the moderator. As I've already said, this is now the third and last online lecture. Uh, we started with a presentation by Professor Dr. Alpermann from the University of Würzburg. He described how the framework conditions for scientific cooperation with China have changed in recent years. And we also discussed the often complex framework conditions that many people now face when deciding with whom they can and may cooperate on the Chinese side. In conclusion, however, Professor Alpermann also emphasized that the exchange with China is indispensable. However, the question of how to organize it remains open. Therefore, we also took the chance on the second online presentation to continue this discussion. Yesterday, for the second presentation, we had Dr. Sikun Alves speaking about the rethinking cultural cooperation with China. In her plea for cooperation, even in difficult times, she, she um, spoke about managing chances and advocating cooperation with China. She also highlighted goals, options, and actions and perspectives for actors in Germany by providing her own example of the, and I hope I translate this correctly, the Chinese German University College, or in German called the um, Chinesisch Deutsche Hochschulkolleg. In this cooperation, multiple universities cooperate for already more than 20 years. However, even this flagship project has gone through transformation throughout the last years. In today's third keynote speech, our speaker will shed light on the status quo of further cooperation projects with China, focusing on the cultural sector and addressing the trends and challenges from a broader European perspective. 
But now let me introduce our speaker, Monique Knappen. Um, she's an expert in the field of international cultural relations, especially in the art and culture sector between Netherlands and China. And uh, I'm already really curious because yesterday we heard that the Netherlands are a very good example of uh, cultural cooperation. Um, Monique studied social history at Erasmus University in Rotterdam and completed a minor in uh, Sinology in Leiden. Um, Monique also studied at Beijing University as an exchange student and started her career in Shanghai at a local radio station and working for a British company that serviced radio programs in five Chinese cities. Overall, she worked in China for six years in various jobs, including radio or the film festival. After her return to the Netherlands, she worked as a program director for China for nearly 10 years at Dutch Culture, which is an independent foundation funded by the Dutch government to facilitate cultural exchange with selected numbers of countries. Since 2017, she co-founded her own company, The China Connector, which is a boutique consultancy with a strong emphasis on facilitating cultural projects between China and the Netherlands. The China Connector also works together in projects related to art exhibitions and art sales. Since the start uh, of the China Connector, Monique is working as the China Coordinator for Creative Netherlands, the international part of the top sector creative industries. Dear Monique, we are now very excited to hear your insights, so the stage is yours. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And thank you, Yannick, and all the others at IFA uh, for inviting me to speak to you. It's a great honor to speak for IFA and the Mark Rater Stiftung. Um, I'm sorry that my German is not good enough, so you have to face my English, which is, of course, not also not my mother tongue, but I think English is then the common, lingua, uh, common language that we can use. I'm also very excited to talk to you because um, as maybe one of my the predecessors in the series, I am not uh, a professor. I am not working at the university, but I am working daily um, with China uh, on a more private uh, level, although I have worked, as Sabrina said, for our government to make cultural policy. Cultural exchange, that's the subject of today. Cultural exchange with China. Why do we do it? Is it for our own benefit or are we doing this for altruistic reasons? When I came to China in 1991, I was struck by the Chinese society, the culture and the interest in Western culture. It was so different than my Western culture and, and, and what I thought about it. At that time, Europe was gradually more and more interested in China. In the 90s, this also China was slowly opening up. Although the students' demonstrations of June 1989 and its aftermath proved China was not a free society yet, we all hoped, and I also hoped, that, that China would become more like us, an open, maybe democratic country. Now we face the fact that most countries in the world are not a full democracy and the democracies we are living in, I think Germany, the Netherlands and, and many other Western democracies are under threat of a, of a right-wing politics maybe and with sometimes people asking for closing borders and, and more and more using our own resources. So it's, we're also a little bit closing down, closing up. So this is the, you could say the, 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 the field we're working in now. I mean, coming from the 90s when I lived in China, everything was kind of open and we all were very optimistic. And now we are facing a different time politically also. In the more than 30 years that I worked with China in the field of cultural cooperation, I found that general, in general that China was always much more interested in cooperation than we were. Uh, they were always trying to learn from, from us. I always felt, and that's my, my point also, that, that we had a more patronizing way of trying to introduce our world to China without really looking what was going on in China itself, what developments there were. In the last 30 years, I think I, I already mentioned that there were many, many changes. I want to mention some of it. 
The first one, China, Chinese people in general are very aware of their, are much more aware now of their identity and they're more proud of it. China has grown tremendously and is looking for their place in the world from being the supplier of cheap products towards a leading economy. For example, in Amsterdam now, since three years, I think two years, maybe, I think it started in COVID times, there is now a shop where you can buy tea, Chinese tea, and, um, and you can see Chinese art. Uh, they also introduce Western art to Chinese public. Uh, they want to make this brand. It's called Cha Art. They want to go to Berlin. They want to go to Copenhagen. They want to go to Barcelona. You can really see there are young people trying to introduce Chinese culture to Amsterdam, to, to European cities. I think that would have been totally not existing 10 years ago. You can really feel that Chinese people are proud of their own culture and want to bring it to us. Secondly, what has changed? We Western people um, have to face a stronger China, a China that is self-aware and proud of their culture. If we are talking cultural exchange, we mainly thought of bringing our culture to China. However, we were not so much interested in Chinese culture. At least we did not, not know so much about it. I can give an example of the Van Gogh Museum trying in 1914, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, nine, sorry, 2014 to make an exhibition in, in China with uh, uh, Van Gogh paintings. And then the National Museum in, in China mentioned, oh, we could do exchange. We could bring a Qi Bai Shi uh, exhibition to the Netherlands. And I don't know, many people know about Qi Bai Shi, but he was a, a contemporary. I mean, he was living in the same times as Van Gogh. And he is selling for the same prices now on auctions in, in the world, especially in China, of course, because lots of Western people, including the, the, the Van Gogh Museum, had never heard of it. So it's just a matter of we were trying to bring this exhibition, but we're not really open for an exhibition in return. Third, uh, I want to say that, of course, it's the COVID. The China's zero policy make our encounters impossible. I my, myself have not been to China for three years and knowledge of China in general, I think, also an expert in, in science, uh, sinologists uh, need to go to China. So if you cannot travel, knowledge is, I think, decreasing, understanding is less. And I think also interest is diminishing if you cannot meet each other. The difference in approach of the COVID situation and the geopolitical situation, especially after the start of the Ukrainian war, makes it hard to have cultural exchange. For example, France stopped a Renoir exhibition going from the north of France, from a, 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 a city um, museum to go to UCCA in Be Beijing because China was not taking our stand. I think that is a very, yeah, to be honest, I think this is a very uh, sad situation. We were also planning to have an old master exhibition with paintings from private collectors to bring to Shanghai to a private museum, but the collectors didn't trust to go to China at this moment. We could understand, of course, but that was also a very, you know, a pity that people don't trust each other anymore because of political reasons. Furthermore, there were also, of course, practical problems like very few air routes and very expensive containers to, to trade. We had an exhibition last year um, from Amsterdam about um, art that is called um, uh, brute art or uh, it's art made by not professional. I'm just now looking for the name. It's uh, Outsider art, that's a strange name. Outsider art that then Hainan, there was a new museum in uh, Outsider art, it was the first museum. So we were very happy that we could bring a Dutch uh, selection of out outsider art. And it was also funny that I was thinking that, that our collection or the Dutch the national collection of outsider art would be the main uh, um, exhibition, but of course in China they also had their own outsider art, so they had added uh, not, we had I think 60 objects, but they had 400 of national uh, outsider arts artists, which was great. 
Uh, but to get the art back, uh, that was just a disaster. We had to wait for more than six months before we were able to get the art back to, to Amsterdam, which of course had costed a lot of more money. And also for the museum, it was very hard to grasp the idea that the art was somewhere in Shanghai and we couldn't get it back. So that is really making life very, very difficult. So those things like, so the, 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 the change of the identity or like the strong identity of Chinese people trying to find their way into the world or like to take their position in the world, which I can totally understand from their point of view. That is something that changed. Another change is that, yeah, we are always trying to bring our culture in general without really looking or interest in getting something back. That's my opinion. And the third, of course, this COVID situation makes it very, very hard to do culture exchange. What is also not helping is that the image of China in my country at least is, has become less popular. I think that's the same in, in all countries in Europe and, and especially in also in the US. That's another subject actually, how the US looks at, at China. And I was reading a book uh, when I was flying to the US about China, they were already looking at me as, as if I was an enemy of, of, of the US when I said I speak Chinese and I lived there and I'm doing business with them. Um, the general feeling is that China is a country we should not cooperate with. We should only do it if we benefit from it. People feel like China is stealing our intellectual property and they are not to be trusted. Again, we are not able to travel to China, so we cannot check things. That makes it also hard to find out what is really going on. And, um, and it sometimes somehow makes a lot of people taking conclusions on how they are managing, you know, stupid uh, COVID regulations, human rights, it is all negative. And we, we are also facing the effects of inflation because of the war, the climate problems, migrants, we do not have houses for, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the general feeling is we have to protect what we have. So why would we give it away? Like we are, we're, having, we're having difficulties ourselves too. In the meantime, our company, the China Connector, we do get requests from China to cooperate. Requests from private institutions, museums, cultural companies. They are used to have commercial projects now. Before COVID, there was already quite some exchange. For example, the Centre Pompidou from, Fran from, uh, from France, they have a, uh, their own museum in Shanghai. The Victoria and Albert Design Museum in Shenzhen. Cultural exchange in the pure sense is between countries on a national level without a commercial angle. These projects also exist, but are, if we're talking about art, often this difficult to materialize. China would have another, has, a, has another pace. I mean, they have another you know, time of, 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 of planning those things. And Western institutions are often not run by governments. An example, you know, of, of the, uh, when, when uh, the Prime Minister of France, Hollande, in that time, the national, uh, he came to, 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 uh, to, to Beijing and he asked all the national uh, museums to bring uh, mu uh, paintings to the National Museum. So, but in Holland, for example, that's not possible. We can, our government cannot ask museums to, to cooperate with, with China. That's their own decision. But I think like Germany, UK and France, they also have their national institutes in those countries like Goethe Institute, British Council, Maison Descartes. They can bring programs on a national base and they often can also finance that through their own program. They can, uh, program, uh, they can program this, but sometimes I feel like it's also promoting their own rich culture without really looking what is happening in the country there. Sometimes these programs are also paid by providing these language programs, which is, I think is a very good thing to do because that's a very sustainable model. But I feel like you should, it's maybe also a little bit, yeah, you have to really look what is happening in those countries to be successful. You can also see it 
there is now this, I feel like this model is a little bit outdated if you also look at the cultural institutes that China is bringing to the world. And we see, we see them as propaganda and sometimes political vehicle, vehicles. Uh, like think of the way how Confucius institutes are used these days. And I tend to go to the cultural center a lot in uh, The Hague, we have one, but I also see that the program is very much, yeah, uh, programmed by Chinese way of thinking, not always really connecting to what the Dutch are looking at, uh, for example, performing arts or uh, visual arts. So we, I'm, I'm actually with our company trying to help them to see how we could make a better connection because my passion is really to bring knowledge about China towards the Netherlands, towards Europe. So how we should we do it then? Um, I mentioned humble in my title, so from patronizing to to more a, a, a humble position. My point is that we came from a relatively pat patronizing attitude towards exchange and that we need to be more, become more humble in the sense that we should be aware of our own place and our place in, 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 in time and in the world. We have to look at our, our culture in, uh, in that respect and how can we cooperate with our culture with, it, with, with China. China was in the 90s very interested in our culture. We were ready to show. Now, given the current situation, we need to fit in China in a more equal way. What binds us? Binds us? What can we do together? Why should we show a Van Gogh, for example, for Van Gogh exhibition in China? What is the relation with China? And why would we show Chinese artists, for example, in, in our countries? It should we should have true interest in the program and we should relate it to our local situation. Are the programs arranged by governmental organization and therefore more based on, on other initiatives than art alone? Uh, is there an also another political agenda to it? We have to be very aware with that. So my point is that we, I think we should continue finding a, a new balance, uh, finding, uh, projects that are important to each other uh, society and yeah I think art and culture is a very good way of connecting people that's also the title of my company I really feel that that's the way to to move forward uh, and I again still believe that Chinese people are so much in need of this cooperation that's what I feel uh, in a way I feel that the, the Dutch uh, France, French people I work with, maybe some Germans and also some UK people that they are interested, but many times it is also about their own interests. So I feel like it's, we should really reconsider that. And maybe I can close up with, um, with an example we do now with the uh, Creative NL program we do in uh, Hong Kong. Actually, I'm quite excited because I will go to Hong Kong next month for the first time. Like I said, in three years, I will be able to go eastwards. And we're trying to make a program for our um, creative uh, industries. That's smaller and middle-sized creative industries. But we only do it for innovative uh, programming around circular design. Because uh, and it took us two years for the Dutch government to decide upon this, to find um, common ground with China to develop uh, uh, programs that can really help to meet our sustainable development goals. So in a, in a way that we are not bringing something that we think we can sell in China, but we really try to make something that is yeah, harmonizing or balancing our common grounds and really try to make a new program together. Because I really feel that co yeah, it's maybe a, a cliche, but this co-creation idea is, I think, well, key to all these things. It's not us bringing something there anymore or showing something that we feel like they should know because it's, you know, the Western world in art is, of course, always leading the way we transport art, for example. We tell them how to do things. And I think we should be much more open in the way of why are we doing this? How can we do this together and how can we benefit all of us? That is actually my, uh, my talk. Thank you I so much, Monique. Yes.
Sorry, my pleasure. Uh, interrupt. It's good, uh, okay. To be in discussion with lots of you because I think it's always more nice when we have, um, yeah, an exchange of ideas. Absolutely. So you're free to ask questions. I would have a first question for you. You spoke about also a little bit of we need to transform kind of our current cultural cooperation form somehow to make it more kind of a co-creation so would you say there are also some um, examples in the past where this co-creation has already taken place where you could really say say okay it's not just a win for the dutch um, art exhibitions or providers of, of artwork um, but also for china is there a good example that you could mention well, yeah, it's true. It's it's a nice in theory how to do it, huh? uh, especially when you're not able to travel. I remember that there was I was also involved with making a film treaty, like maybe co-producing films together, for example. Uh, it took I think three years, and now there is finally uh, going to be released a film that is made with China's uh, China's help, Chinese money, but also Chinese ideas on children's, a children's uh, film. Uh, so uh, at first, sometimes in China, it needs a framework to be able to work on the co-creation. Co also, of course, we have to face that there is a cultural bureau. You have to have things um, checked by the government. Uh, my uh, my uh, experience also with working in Shanghai in 2010 is that you, ha you have to be very open. You can tell um, I know that there are many people in China that are also doing self-censorship, but I, you know, that's, that's an advantage of being a foreigner. You can be open and you can tell, this is the idea we have. How can we work on this project together? It will benefit us both. I mean, that's, that's, that's the leading thing. It should benefit both. So if you want to make an international film, for example, we have this film treaty. How can we um, generate funds for this? I think this, there is now a fund uh, for that. And then we can uh, co write the script and find a way to make this happen. Probably not everything is, is, is then possible at the same time, but at least you can try and see if you work together how you can really co create. So that's, that's, that is now, I think, an example that is, is happening now. I think the film will be released in two months. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite happy that that worked out even after two or three years that it, this, uh, co, uh, this film co-production program is, is running. Um, in terms of, for example, um, the visual arts, there was a lot of requests from China having, for example, this Van Gogh exhibition or even Mondrian exhibition or now we're talking, we're actually also helping Tate Britain in UK. Um, many times Chinese would like to add things to it. Like for example, what happened with the outsider art exhibition in Hainan. So to also make it into a Chinese program. Mm -hmm. When we did the program from the Netherlands outsider art to Hainan, I never asked, that's also my mistake, will there be Chinese? Uh, how can we make this into a more um, yeah, in, in a better way. Huh? We were also trying to uh, convince the Amsterdam Museum to do this. So like we were very busy with that. And later when I found out that it was a much bigger exhibition, also including Chinese, uh, I think they did it themselves. They made it into a co-creation without even me knowing it. And of course the Dutch wanted to go to Hainan to open to the opening and also our consulate was involved and they were we were planning to do a conference around it so that that the Dutch people uh, from the outsider art would like to make a conference an international conference taking Hainan really as a as a member in this community but that never happened because of COVID so that's a little mm. of my two examples that I could give. Okay, thank you for those insights. Uh, we also have uh, one hand raised now by Mr. Khan Ackermann. Um, please feel free to first maybe introduce yourself to Monique so she knows who she's talking to and then also uh, ask your question, please. My name is Michael Khan Ackermann. Uh, I have been the founding director of Goethe Institute in Beijing and worked uh, as uh, regional director of the Goethe Institute for China. Now I'm uh, retired, but I live in China and work still in China. So that's what I have to say. Uh, first, I would really uh, like to thank that you uh, that you stressed um, that working with China 
doesn't not only need to reflect the situation in China and restrictions we are facing now, but it has uh, it, it needs self-reflection and a kind of change of behavior and outlook on what China can give us and how we can profit from that what we get out of China. That's, uh, I, I found it this very refreshing. Uh, my question is, um, you probably work with uh, official institutions and with private and commercial institutions. Yes. Um, uh, it is uh, obvious that it is more and more difficult to, to cooperate with uh, official institutions because the restrictions there work very heavy. And of course, not only it's not only Corona which makes it so difficult, but also ideological and political and administrative uh, restrictions. What are your experiences with commercial and non-official institutions? Well, thank you, Michael, for your questions. Um, I'm, I'm also, uh, it's very nice that you are calling in from Beijing. Um, yeah, my experiences with um, commercial institutions in China are very positive. Um, in general, they're run by people that have been abroad. They have seen a lot of institutions abroad and they are really trying to bring international elements in their institutions. They are also aware that uh, this is, needs money, needs a budget that is different with the governmental institutions. Like I said, they expect exchange that, yeah, without any commercial. Um, but the, the private institutions are very aware that then things need to be paid. The problem is in China, it's different than in Europe, that they also need to make their own money because they don't get any funding from the Chinese government. Um, I think Chinese government is, I, I don't know at this moment, but when I traveled often to China, I also visited the cultural ministry and I think you did as well. And I think they also compared themselves then to the United States that they would like to see, you know, a, a thriving private, uh, yeah, uh, how do you say, it? private community that is bringing the best of the best that they feel Chinese uh, commercial inst for governmental institutions cannot pay for. Um, I was not involved with the latest, or maybe you have seen it, there is a Beijing uh, Today Art Museum. They have a Florentine Hoffman exhibition now. I don't know if people know him, but he's a visual artist. He makes this huge uh, animals that are like kind of blown up. He also made the, the duck. I don't know, but I think that is quite popular. That duck was also floating once in the Hong Kong Harbor. Uh, Florentine was not able to travel to Beijing, but uh, everything was produced in China. Uh, and I met the director of the Today Art Museum who visited Amsterdam, I was surprised, uh, two weeks ago. And she told me it was a great success. So they sell the tickets quite high. So it's, uh, they, they have to make this commercially run. Uh, but they're very, very happy to have international uh, um, uh, names around. The problem that's also, I think, universal that, you know, it's also, I think, in Germany, but in the Netherlands also, people tend to, uh, it's like a winner takes all situation. It's always the big names that, of course, uh, attract the largest numbers of people. So that is also a struggle how to get young, new artists, uh, maybe um, get them introduced to, to museums, because if we, if, if you really uh, if you're honest, then the people I talk to in China, they're always looking for the big names, like I said, uh, Van Gogh, uh, uh, Rembrandt, or the, the Mondrian's exhibitions, which is very difficult for Dutch museums to, to accept to travel to an unknown private uh, 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 museum in, in China. But my experience is also in contract-wise, for example, the new Hainan Museum, like I've just mentioned with um, the outsider art, everything was really run professionally. The, the, the climate conditions were good. The contract was uh, followed. Um, I, I was very happy and I can maybe give another example that was, uh, that is actually, I think it is not a commercial uh, uh, institute. It's, it's the Yangzhou 
National Museum for the Canal. So it's the Grand Canal in China, which is very old and very long, runs from uh, Beijing to uh, Hangzhou. Um, they have now a national museum on, on the canal. Uh, Amsterdam City was approached uh, to make a, uh, a, a, an exhibition on the, on the canal of Amsterdam because it's also, I mean, it has to do again with the status of China, showing that they also have a canal, you know, that's like, they, so they reached out to Venice, to Amsterdam to, to bring presentations about the canal, how important that is. Um, Amsterdam City was not interested. They felt, oh, we don't want to have Chinese tourists anymore, and uh, we don't have time for this young Joe. Where is this? But Venice, and they joined. So Venice, they made a presentation, and then later the China Culture Center asked us if we could make it for the China Connector. So we also did it, and I think there was a budget from the uh, government, but that uh, was difficult for them to to spend on a on a commercial party like we. So that went through the China Culture Center. So in China, everything is always possible, uh, at least as you, yeah, if you know people and if you. If you can get, get the trust, which is uh, everywhere important. Sorry for the long answer, but that's. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much for that. Maybe one question to what you said before also, when you mentioned the kids movie. So in this case, like co-creation would more be like everyone puts in their own ideas and in the end you have a product that everyone kind of agrees on right so i'm wondering how you could actually transfer that to other areas like academia for instance um because there i think like in this case it would rather mean that you're only talking about certain non-sensitive topics right so yeah is it just or yeah, yeah, can you help me there? Is it possible? Yeah, well, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a scientist, but I can, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not working in the in the university, but I can imagine that uh, certain um, research questions or uh, departments that are looking into what is happening in China, um, then it's more difficult to make a kind of balanced or like a co-creation because the question like why are you doing this i mean i can imagine that we are also interested in for example uh, i was just talking this morning uh, to somebody like how about the military capacity in china like all these kind of or like what is actually going on or how it's responding i mean there, there can be all kinds of questions that are very much interesting for our country our society uh, to because at the same time that I'm talking about co-production and about leveling, I also feel we have to be aware of our own culture. It's not that I feel like we have to merge into, uh, into one world. Uh, I feel like we have to be aware we are in Europe. We have our own background. We have our own identity. And we also have to protect our identity. But like that's why how I started. Why do we do culture exchange? Is it because of our own benefit, or is it uh, because we want to do something good for the other? I think in the past it was a mix of the both of that. Uh, if we're talking about scientific research, I feel like you also have to be quite strict in why are you doing this. This is the first question. Why would you do that research? If you need China to be able to do that research. And I'm, I'm thinking about the green policies. I would be great to, to like kind of develop together all kinds of or like COVID uh, uh, medicine or something that is like benefiting for the whole world. I, I can imagine that you could try to find the parameters or like the cadres to 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 kind of find a research project that is beneficial for yeah, for, for for mankind without borders, without national elements in it, but. It can also be that you have some projects that yeah, are a little bit more restricted. It's about your own safety or your own strength. Or for example, telecom, I feel like the Dutch or the Germans have to make sure that we are independent for that. Uh, we should not be too naive uh, in those kind of fields. I mean, talking about safety uh, things uh, because China is doing the same thing. They're also quite aware of uh, their own safety net so and then on top of that i think in an umbrella uh, there should always be talks but s some things are difficult to research together if, if they're sensitive issues for example human rights issues we could could also say that we have a different view on that so it's different difficult to find to really meet deeper level 
research on that. So we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't do that because that's not possible with China. But we should not really judge on that immediately. So would you then agree that uh, maybe even if it becomes more difficult in other areas to um, work on cooperation, that within culture and art, it's still the easiest yeah. way to cooperate? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think that is uh, also a function of, uh, of art. Uh, I mean, we're all humans and I, I feel if you look at the popular culture in China, there is so much that they take from European American culture. Uh, of course, they also have their own social media, uh, so they don't have maybe the things, the, the same things they look at, but the way the people dress, the people listen to, there's so many things that that are similar. And I think we should find a way to to level and to yeah to be able to 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 talk to each other because if we don't talk and we we don't have any exchange anymore, then yeah, like I said, we also in the West we're like pulling up these walls and sitting behind it and um yeah i hope really that there is i don't know how because you know tourism as it was before covid was also not ideal uh, but we should have ways to to be more connected and i think arts and culture is is a way to be connected and it's a little bit less sensitive i feel um, um, you also mentioned earlier this example where I think it was a French institute that stopped an exhibition. Have you ever experienced something like this also from the Chinese side that they just said like, okay, no, due to um, like uh, your accusation of human rights or something, we just uh, don't want your exhibition anymore or we don't bring our exhibition the other way around? I heard uh, some, but that was long ago, uh, Japanese that they didn't want, I mean, for the, the the feelings towards Japan are, I think, very uh, negative. And there was a time that uh, now it's, I don't know how it is now, but I know that there was even people f like international or uh, or orchestras when they had Japanese uh, musicians in it, they were, they were not allowed to go into China, which is, yeah, unbelievable. Um, but from the Western side, um, I hear what I hear, I think also that was Michael just saying that there is a strong tendency of having more nationalistic programs. So um, they are still looking for international projects, but then they want also to have a, a Chinese part in it, which is not that bad. I mean, I, I totally can understand, uh, but I have never, I didn't hear from my ch Chinese contacts that they're not interested in, yeah, in a certain area because of our opinion towards sensitive issues. So mm -hmm. that I didn't hear. Okay, maybe we also have more examples in our community. So in case you experience or want to share your experiences or you just have a hint on maybe how to not get into such situations, um, uh, please feel free to just uh, raise your hand and join the discussion. Okay, there's one question by Odila Trieber. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for your um, differentiated approach and, and talking about your experiences. I have a uh, uh, my question is, do you cooperate on a European level and do you see some benefit in it or do it do it only for, um, um, from from an advice on the, on the Netherlands level and cooperate with the, um, a bilateral exchange with China? Yeah, that's a good question. When I was working at Dutch Culture, uh, we tried to do it in a more European way uh, to bring programs like, for example, with UNIC, there is also some uh, cultural programs there. Um, I think for governmental uh, institutions, that is um, uh, something that China likes to do. Uh, but for the more private institutions, they are not really looking at that angle. They are more looking for exchange or I mean, not maybe world exchange may be wrong, but have international projects. And then they don't really mind from which country it comes. Um, you could say that, uh, I mean, I have been now working with French, German, also 
UK programming and um, I could see if I, yeah, I can, I can well, I can see that there is also some differences from the, the countries I work with. For example, with the Netherlands, I think there is from the museum and the cooperations quite a lot of, yeah, uh, questioning on why we would do this. There's a kind of morality in it. People are, I mean, Sabrina was just asking if China would uh, ban some things from their side. It's more that the, I feel that some of the Dutch are really looking into the human rights issue if we're talking about an exhibition going abroad, which I feel it's another level. I feel like, of course, human rights issues have to be raised, but um, yeah, I don't think that it, you should have that in every discussion on every cooperation. Uh, for example, with the UK, they are much more commercial. They are having really departments of having um, traveling exhibitions. So they are not discussing this at all. That's also interesting. And I also feel if you're only doing things for commercial reasons, that can also be um, not always the best way of cooperating uh, because I feel you should have, if you have really sustainable cooperation, it should be in a more deeper level. And I think to be honest to Adila to, to, to address your question right, it is difficult to kind of make a, a European program at this moment to go to, to China in, in cultural exchange. Uh, maybe we should, I should, I, I try to reach out to a German, uh, to, to, sorry, to a French company. Uh, they're doing actually cultural projects from France to, to, to China. I was trying to team up because I feel if you could, if we could find a conglomerate with maybe five or six uh, smaller country, uh, companies to do this together, I think we could have a, have a very strong um, yeah, uh, portfolio and, uh, and a nice way of working together. But I must say that in, in my uh, experience, Chinese people are not really looking at which country you're exactly coming from. I, I got questions like, did the Netherlands sign the One Road, One Belt uh, uh, con uh, project? Uh, but that was only when I, yeah, when I was in China to, to make sure that... Uh, that could have been a benefit, but it's that's not crucial. Okay, thank you. There's also one question um, uh, from Yannick in the chat. Um, he asks whether there are specific forms of art that tend to carry more risk for cooperation. So one example would be films and film festivals, as opposed to uh, paintings. Yeah, uh, I don't work with, for example, literature anymore, uh, but I did in the past. And um, there was some examples of even writers in residence in China. So there was a, a quite a, uh, that before COVID there was a quite a, I think you also know there was quite a, a lively uh, communities of, um, of artists in residence in all different areas, also for writers. So there were people invited to write uh, and also speak about their, uh, their, their literature or writings. And then some of them were also translated and we found out that some of those translations uh, were not accurate, they were censored. And um, now our Dutch uh, people in uh, cultural people in embassy have decided not to work anymore with the, uh, the literature departments uh, at this moment because they were so upset about this um, yeah, violation of, uh, of the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the culture itself. So. Um, that, is, that had happened. Um, and I also know, for example, from performing arts that Dutch uh, dancers were coming and they were having tattoos and were not, able, were not allowed to perform. There was a regulation that tattoos, people with tattoos were not allowed. So what to do? This person was traveling you know, all the way to Beijing to, to dance. And then in the end, they, they covered the tattoos so they, that so they inclined in, in the regulation. But that's a very personal thing. I think also, I mean, I'm not pushing anybody to go to China. I feel like if you want to go to, go to China, it should have a benefit for you. Like it can be inspirational, it can be money, it can be uh, have an exchange or something, but you can, you are also, I mean, we're, we're living in a free country. Uh, so you are also very, I can also totally understand that you not, don't want to go. If you have too many issues privately, personally, with the regime or with, yeah, whatever, 
then nobody's forcing you. So you, you really have to think, why would you do it? That's my general yeah, remark. You really have to think, why would you go to China? What is the benefit? Why would you do it? But you can only benefit from it, I think, when both sides are benefiting from it. Okay, thank you. So we have one question in the chat and also one hand raised. I would start with the hand raised. Uh, Ulrike Sia, please ask a question. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I didn't dare to, to raise my hand before because I'm not a cultural operator. I'm a playwright and a translator. And I work quite a lot in China. I mean, not for years, but for quite a lot of projects. And I was a, a writer in residence because you mentioned it in, at Nanjing University. And I have had lovely experiences in China and I would love to go back. But I also face the problem that many people in the performing arts are really opposing artists going to China. So it's difficult for me to find partners because they, you know, the performing art institutions in Germany, they feel like we shouldn't cooperate with China anymore. I completely agree with you that we should, but I find it difficult to, uh, yeah, to, to, to get beyond these China bashing um, arguments that I always have to face when I say that I can't wait to go back and they say like are you crazy and um, mm -hmm. so I would love also to, uh, I just wanted to stress that it's true that there have been writers and residents and I think many of them made great experiences but I also he heard that especially in the performing arts it's very very difficult in Hong Kong but also in mainland China at the moment and uh, yeah I would love to have a little bit more good arguments to, to talk to especially the German partners when it comes to going back to China because I would really love to and I know you've already mentioned a few but uh, yeah I just wanted to point out because the, the, well, most of you work for institutions but I'm a solo player so so I also wanted to, to raise the voice of the artists and say that some of us are also keen to go back but sometimes we just lack opportunity and arguments to do it. Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, it, it is difficult to find arguments uh, because you can easily say, um, yeah, there are many uh, difficulties. There are many things that make it also hard for performing artists in China to do what they want to do. It's not a free country, uh, but I feel the most strong argument is that there are many people in China interested in you, uh, interested in international thinking and international arts. Um, and they are really keen to see it all. They have, I mean, in my opinion, they, they, they have studied. I mean, there's so many people that are really studying what is happening here, even now. And to be able to go there and meet new friends, that is so important for, for, for you also as an artist to, to, to connect to other cultures. But you cannot, um, yeah, you, we cannot as an individual change China as it is. China also has a right to develop in their own way. But of course, we would love to see the people free and to do what they feel they can do. But if I talk to Chinese officials about that, they say, yeah, but we need to have our own development, our own pace. pace. And sometimes we make mistakes, sometimes we go on. I don't know. I mean, I haven't not been to China. I'm also not saying that everything is right what's happening there. I also have sometimes my my feelings. I maybe I can share one personal thing. I, I discussed with the human rights uh, watch people uh, my work, what I'm doing. Is this good or is this bad? You know, is is it good to have a cultural exchange all the time, even though there are so many people that have problems in China? And then they said, she said, it's you should do it because it's you have to be aware of who you work with. But if you have people are really interested in the arts, then it's that's something that sparks people and makes people think, and it's good to be in, in contact. But again, I'm not doing everything. I mean, if, if I feel like I'm, I mean, that's also what our government is, uh, is telling us. If you are asked to do programs that are, yeah, clearly oppressing or you're being used for something that you don't want to be used for, then you don't do it. So I try to be working with professionals and really looking at the arts itself. Okay, thank you. So we have an additional question in the chat by Uri Seumann. Um, looking on art and culture, communication is an essential part of the game. 
there is a difference between inter, multi and transcultural communication. How do you distinguish and which parts play in and which part plays the transcultural perspective? Oh, um, difficult question. Inter, multi and transcultural communication. Um, maybe a transcultural um, perspective. Yeah. Does Ulrich mean then that you have to explain, you know, the different... Maybe he's able to uh, turn on his microphone and uh, clarify yeah. the question, maybe. If I talk about transcultural, then I feel like you have to explain interculturally why, what their differences are, or what do you mean? <clears throat> well, I face... Um, um, well, we talk about communication and uh, inter or multi or transcultural communication. And for me, well, I have at least, um, uh, I distinguish the three in the way like, uh, like how to learn a language. You have to learn the vocabulary. So this is the intercultural. Yeah. And then you have the grammatics. This is the multicultural. And then you have, when you step into a new language, when you uh, jump into the cold water and try to communicate and to speak and to 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 listen then you face the transcultural perspective and this means um, I also have to face myself and my emotional resonance when communicating and this is very different you know to uh, to the to the learning of, uh, of, of the of vocabulary and and grammatics and mm -hmm. uh, and this um, I, I like the way how you you talk about and share your experience in uh, in working on with with art and culture, and for me it seems to be I mean the transcultural perspective seems um, a, a, a deep necessity to uh, to to really um, to really have success or to, yeah. to really um, well come to the end, and um, for me and that's my my experience. Well, I'm I'm a uh, psychotherapist and and, uh, and a coach, and I work since a lot of years in in China, and uh, and um, uh, for me, uh, the first time when I went there, I, um, um, I I I was asked to I mean to com communicate some kind of body psychotherapy approach, and I did this, and uh, when I came back, I had more questions in my luggage than I, uh, you know. And uh, I, th I can imagine that many of us um, have the same experience yes. and this is part of the transcultural yeah. um, uh, communication. And I miss uh, this part uh, in, I mean, uh, trying to, to find some, some relation or some encounter mm -hmm. uh, in China and Germany. And, um, and uh, yeah. And, and, don't, you, um, don't you think, I mean, you are expert in this, that's this kind of way of communicating, like this deeper way of communication is only possible when you're really open towards another yeah. culture. Because if you're only trying to, I mean, I also made the same mistakes. I mean, I, although I studied Chinese and I speak Chinese, I also traveled sometimes just going there just two days and you want to do the, you know, your mm -hmm. project and you leave again eh? without mm -hmm. really looking at what is happening there? What is need? Uh, who yeah. are the people? Um, it, it, everything gets better with this kind of attention for it and really open to, yeah. Also, I, I, kind of, I can relate to your question now better because I remember when I, when I came there for the first time, also even your, how do you say it? In, in Dutch, we say referentiekader. Eh? So like your, the things you know mm -hmm. and how you react to things also the, yeah, um, uh, are of influence on your communication. Mm. I remember when I was living there for the first six years in my, uh, from 1990 to 1995, then I was flying to go back home or to take a holiday. At that time, people didn't ha even have a passport, you know, to even talk about a holiday. That was just mm. something mm. that they could not relate to. So how to make a communication really valuable mm. or like very deep you have to find a common ground that is, yeah, uh, meaningful for both. Because uh, otherwise, you, yeah, there, there, you, you talk to them, but there is no, there, there is no, no deep, there is no connection. Yeah, and this is my experience when I was the first time in Peking. 
I <clears throat> was there for, I had an invitation for two days to a conference, and then I took another seven days just to walk uh, through the city. And I distinguish there is a, a knowing about another culture, and also there is a sensed knowing, yeah. you know, a knowing by sensing, by walking, by smelling, by, you know. But the interesting yeah. thing is that you also see Chinese young people coming here before COVID, making the same mistakes as we did, like you yeah. did. It's also a universal thing. I also met very young, bright kids who came here. I was in the board here of a Hermitage Museum in Amsterdam, and they wanted to, sh to start a museum in Shanghai in one of the, the towers on the, in Pudong, the TV mm -hmm. tower. And then I asked them, oh, uh, do you have any experience in, in, in making an exhibition or doing an, a museum? They're like, no, 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 but we have money and we can do this, you know, like the coming in and flying out. So I was shocked to also meet Chinese people having the same attitude as we did, because I was always used to a more. Uh, so the, my, my point is that I think it's a universal problem. And I think in the, in the days that uh, when I traveled first to China, China was really open for us and now you can also see people are more yeah modern people have to work really hard the pressure is high so sometimes people also are not really looking into this uh, i mean i was surprised to see that the chinese culture is in that respect sometimes also maybe even getting more global um uh, but it's true we have to find a good communication and really look listen longer than yeah than you maybe I have time for sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Also to Mr. Solman for explaining your question. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should take in the others again <laughs> into the discussion. Um, there's one question in the chat by Daniela Hochstetter and she's um, saying you already mentioned the ethical dimension in dealing with the topic of human rights. How do you negotiate this with your project partners in Europe and what kind of red lines did you experience? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, where can I start? Many times when I talk to artistic directors, people are really inspired by what's happening in China, interested also to see, for example, that museums or not, maybe you cannot use the term museum, but maybe like art spaces, for example, in shopping malls. They're really trying to have, there, there are many, developments in China because of the vastness of the country and also the, you know, the way that the economic um, development has happened, you can see that art uh, is looked at at a different way. I think that is, that is very logical and that's also interesting. So a lot of artistic directors have interest in going there and seeing it and working together. But we also face the fact that we have boards of museums that maybe are consisting of people that have an economic background or legal background, and they only see the difficulties. Uh, so they mentioned then, then, yeah, human rights situation. Um, and they are preventing uh, a museum to work together with, uh, with China. Like also happened in, in, in Rennes, in France, with this Renoir exhibition in UCCA. Yeah, I can, uh, I can understand um, the position, especially for uh, yeah, maybe the legal position, or people are afraid that maybe art will be contained because of the geopolitical situation. But then again, I feel this human rights issue I think you have to look at it from different levels. I feel like our government, our Dutch government, for example, they should talk, especially in European um, Verband, uh, yeah, in European Union, um, poss yeah, possible not only as one country, but we have to speak out as European countries on, on certain issues. I feel like that is the national level. I feel companies, including museums, shouldn't always talk at first about human rights. Better to bring a program and then discuss in a larger scale, in, an, in another setting about difficulties. If you're talking about taking out an art piece because uh, you know, that is censored, that I think is another situation. I think then you have to have, have, have a real issue. 
you could say, then we're not working together anymore. I can imagine that. I never really faced that. Maybe it's also because of the subjects we, we brought, but I can imagine if, for example, with this writer thing that you say, oh, now this is, this is the limit. I'm not, I'm not going to take that anymore. Um, I was just thinking of something that, um, but I, I, oh yeah, I remember once I was still working for Dutch culture, Ai Weiwei was in jail in, in China. And um, the vice minister of culture came to the Netherlands and was meeting with his counterparts. And the first thing that uh, our Dutch uh, official mentioned was a whole story about human rights issues, which of course is his position. And as I, like I said, national governments should do that. But it was even before he welcomed the, the minister of China coming in. And what happened then was that the, the, the Chinese minister was addressing uh, his comments uh, in like double the time and explaining how wonderful the situation was in China. So it's like useless though, in that, that respect. I am, can imagine that you have to mention this, but like I said, maybe Mr. Ulrich just mentioned it earlier, better, you have to find an, an intercultural uh, talk to be really changing things. You're not going to, yeah. But it's a difficult issue. I can totally imagine that some of the artists that feel like I'm not going to deal with China because it's, it's I don't like their attitude towards the Uyghurs or to, yeah, to, to certain uh, artistic developments. But from the other side, I feel like there are institutions, and I'm a member myself of Amnesty. I feel like you have to, to treat all these things on a level. But again, if it's in a project that it's, it's censured, then I think you should really, that's the limit for me. But I have never luckily encountered this situation. Okay, thank you. There's also another question from uh, Stephanie Tiedek. Um, she says, apart from the approach to sensitive issues, Adding to your point of understanding each other, I feel that interests in Germany or Europe and China sometimes are quite different. Here the interest lays um, in issues such as diversity, inclusion, identity, migration, feminism, yeah. barrier-free accessibility and sustainability, climate concerns, etc. I think the list is much longer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are the issues you approach? <laughs> well, it's true. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice remark because I think that is showing also our own interests like why are we doing this we want to be like a little bit like the, the preacher telling what it's you know what the world should look like so diversity uh, me tooism you know all these kind of things we feel like we have to to express uh, which is a, I mean, it's not bad but i like i said you have to see what is needed in china and why is how does it resonate uh, maybe better to start maybe on a lower level and to, to see uh, if you can really come to a dialogue and maybe your, or our idea uh, on, yeah, this maybe very modern or new approaches is not the best way to, yeah, to approach. Um, for example, with this creative industries project I do, we do work together on this, uh, this green uh, sustainable development goals because we feel like that is something that China is also working on. Um, I know that there are, I mean, the Dutch uh, um, consulates and I think also Germany will probably have some um, diversity projects like they, they, uh, they promote the gay parade if there is any in, in Shanghai, for example, I remember. I think that's also good to show it's more on a national level than like your policies, like showing this kind of things we really think is important. But it, that's another thing that, that too, you have a, a real co-production thing in it. So maybe at different levels. You could say it's important to show it what we are standing for, but then I think it's more a governmental thing. Um, and I think it will also filters it out because I don't think that the commercial in private institutions We'll look at that at the first time because they have to sell the tickets again so it's maybe it's also good to to bring it as a, as a side program but you also always have to discuss this with your partner mm -hmm. the one who just raised a question also has raised her hand now so i think she wants to add something um please go ahead Stephanie. yeah thank you um 
I'm my approach isn't to um, or um, to go and lecture, um, go there and have the issues. But I think actually that many times it's also we have these issues here and we would like to know what other parts of the world think about it. Um, mm -hmm. How yeah. we, we think it's so um, important, these issues, or, it, it, climate change or migration or whatever, uh, all these kind of things. And I'm working in the art, art fields as well, so I'm also um, dealing with art projects. So um, from from Germ from the German side, there's um, this um, intense questioning of how do you, China in this case, deal with these things? What can we learn from each other? And then oftentimes it's um, that the Chinese side is, especially in the issues I just um, dropped in here, it's just not really that interested. Mm. You know, and then, then on the other hand, we have, um, for example, digitalization, we have a real problem here. So um, Germany is always very interested in what China is doing there. But um, then China is like, um, yeah, OK, I can tell you about these cases. But, you know, then the communication side is uh, it, 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 it runs in parallel, I, I have yeah. the feeling. So my question was rather what kind of issues or what kind of themes um, do you go by artist or do you do you curate also shows where you have like um, an issue you want to put forward? Yeah. yeah, I must say that most of the questions, I mean, that the recent two, three years come from China, so not from the Netherlands. Uh, I have to say that UK is bringing some of the programs also even Americans have programs to bring. Uh, but that's then really art related without really an, an, uh, very much of a societal or issue. Um, but I, I like your, uh, your, um, your angle to it because it's true that we also are interested in how they look at certain issues. I have the feeling that um, because of the way that institutions are run like governmental they don't have money to pay for it so they are very a little bit old-fashioned if you talk about exchange if we talk about the private ones they have to make the money so it's it's also sometimes difficult to have really societal issues raised but i know there is a lot of discussion about this kind of yeah more societal issues eh? um i don't think they have a tradition to put that into exhibitions yet or like debating programs yet because it's also their yeah i think their culture to not openly discuss sometimes difficult issues it's more like on private scale that we talk about it um to have institutions or like debating clubs uh talking about not uh, like concrete or like technical problems like you said the digitalization or yeah for example if we talk about arch architecture like a city building um they like the issue of having like how to make a city that people like to live in and what kind of issues are related to that uh, then it's it's a topic that they like to talk about but if you if you would only take the topic like how to live in a building and uh, how do you for how do you live in a uh, how to make it a social livable or how to include everybody then they feel it's already it's a problem and they don't really like to 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 take out that as a as a bigger theme they always look forward in a kind of yeah it's difficult to explain but they we are tending to to look at a problem to take the problem and put it on the table and discuss it uh, in china it's more like what is the effect of it? What shall, what can, how can we benefit from it? What can we learn from it? And then, of course, you have all these angles, but it's a little bit different way of putting it together. So it, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you also were aware of the issue of the, the tennis player, for example, this, this uh, Me Too uh, stuff. Uh, it was, in Chinese view, much too explicit to put it of course it was also a sensitive issue uh, to it of this pol political high leader who did it uh, but the issue that there are women having these problems i think that was viral immediately because there is it's but to put that issue so up front it's very difficult for chinese to to do in general as a culture but i think 
it is very good to 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 find ways and i think we have to be also humble again to find a way to discuss these kind of issues because it is interesting to see how we manage in the world with these issues okay thank you um there's also one comment in the chat i'll just read it out um thanks for the practical approach to starting collaboration with focus what the collaboration is about without highlighting the human rights issue at the beginning it might help to create some trust and common ground at the beginning and not framing every uh, every form of exchange with aspects of democracy free speech etc all of it remains highly relevant but often also blocks important first steps i, I think agree. this is also about um, yeah. just connecting first, like building trust before you actually are able to exchange on, on other levels. Yeah. I must also say, I don't know if people in, in the group have experienced that if you take it so hard, if you discuss immediately about, I mean, I try, I mean, I remember that I had a discussion with the previous ambassador here when I, I just visited Hong Kong because of a project I did for TAFAF, the big art fair and I went to, uh, to uh, Hong Kong in 2019 and I was struck by the fact that Hong Kong people didn't feel Chinese. They were all going on the streets doing demonstrations and of course we know what happened and after that I spoke to the ambassador in, uh, in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, Chinese ambassador, and I was trying to discuss this and uh, he only gave me uh, yeah, the, the Chinese way. And I also felt like it was so hard to to grasp that. I, I, I know this is myself, so I, but I, I, then again, I also have, and I also had this issues on, on the Ukraine war, like how people, Chinese people see it, but I also still try to, you know, knock myself in the face and try to, to also look at it from their perspective um, and try still to, to talk about it in, in maybe in a not in the beginning or like, yeah too upfront because it's 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 and i also uh, take it into my account because i also have my own my own looking at things i mean we are standing with ukraine and we feel like this is it's very important to us but you look at the world i mean how look at indonesia looks at it south africa looks at it it's yeah we we think we are doing the right thing and i think we do <laughs> but you also have to still still take respect of people with other views or and that's also having sometimes another reason. So it's not always black and white. That's just what I want to say. Okay, thank you. We have two more comments in the chat. Um, uh, one is by Petra Müller and she asks, are SDG items a link for both sides? And then we also have uh, Ulrich Solman again, who wants to share a little example, but I think I'll take the SDG item question first and then we'll have uh, Ulrich Solman because I think it fits um, right now the discussion. So I think like uh, for starting a discussion probably or starting some um, cooperation, I think SDG, this is, or this question is relating to whether um, SDG items are a good yeah, part the sustainable to start off. The sustainable development goals, I think China has at least uh, signed the Paris Treaty. So that's what I also said earlier. It's good to find common ground. If you agree on certain things, you can build from there. It's also why I thought it was a pity that uh, the, what Merkel, the coming to Merkel, she arranged before she left that there was an agreement with Europe and uh, in China. You could discuss about a lot of things, but there is something you can build on. China was very disappointed when, uh, when we rejected the deal. Uh, so I, I don't know all the details about the SDGs, uh, but I know that China is, they signed the treaty, unless, you know, I mean, like what Trump did, he, he dropped out, but China is trying to build on it. And of course, they have their own difficulties on getting that vast country into the same, you know, in, in, into all these, uh, in the pace of the SDGs and the, the Paris Treaty, but they they have signed it and they are looking for um, that, that's something that we really share so that's something that um, we want to work on yeah and maybe even uh, single items of the sdgs could also help to make a start because it's yeah. so broad actually to exactly um, also yeah. work on social aspects so, if you yeah. have the common ground you can build from there and then you mm. can build the trust and then you can go to another program yeah Okay, thank you. So Ulrich Salman, please uh, go ahead, but I would like to ask you to keep it short as we are almost at the end already. Um, yeah, the example is very easy. 
uh, Angela Merkel, when she was in China in 2015 or 16, she did it in a very um, good way. She started in Chengdu to, together with a very famous television cook. He went to the, she went to the market, paid by herself what she bought, some fish and some meat and some vegetable. And then on television, she celebrated the most delicious dinner of uh, Mao Zedong. <laughs> and then she went behind the political closed doors for two days. And the last day, she had an open uh, lecture at Tsinghua uh, University, which uh, was presented online. And there she talked about human rights. So she just did it the other way around. And um, talking about the issues, uh, one of my books on sexual abuse was just published in China. So it is open somehow, though there is a big uh, restriction on uh, psychological books from the Western part. And still, there is something going on below the radar, you know. And I also like, I mean, we had a, it's maybe, yeah, our late uh, mayor of Amsterdam, he declined to see Putin when he arrived in Amsterdam, which was, of course, a political act, which was 2014. And then people were uh, um, angry at him and he said why are you going to china if you uh, if you you know refuse putin he said in china there is first of all a tendency that there is looking there are people looking at you know it's a scientific way of really having reasoning and really trying to benefit the whole you know the society as a whole and i, I agree with that i mean although there are many things and many flaws and many things that are not good in china yet but i mean hey Look at the rest of the world. It's never, it's never a paradise, and we have to, to, yeah, we're we're stuck in this world, and we have to see how we can make it a little bit better. So we, we should be in contact. Okay, thank you. Maybe just one last question, as we're almost running out of time. Um, discussing just about China and all the cooperations between European partners and China. Um, there's also the discussion about um, the export of soft power, of course, um, like we experienced this a lot in the African continent and of course also in uh, like Germany and other European countries um, through the Confucius Institute and so on. Um, in Germany, we're right now in kind of like, uh, I would call it a little bit of a bubble as we're reassessing the strategy on also partly how to um, accept finances uh, or financing partners, corporations and so on. Um, that are coming like from both sides and um, there's also a great um, insecurity kind of between the actors of what they could actually accept and what they can't accept and so on. Is there a similar kind of movement in the Netherlands right yeah. now as well? Yeah. yeah. Actually, um, Ingrid de Hoge, a scientist you know, uh, they made a report on the influence of um, uh, yeah, Chinese actors uh, in our educational system, and they're also making a report on the uh, Dutch society as a whole, like uh, how are institutions from China infiltrating um, yeah, our, uh, our, our society. Um, I think it's very good to be aware of what is going on. I mean, uh, I think we came from a, a period that everything was accepted and that we were like, very open to everything, uh, also with, again, with our own uh, goals, huh? like we wanted to, to sell something or want to show something. And then we are like, everything was allowed. Uh, I think it's much better to be very aware and especially with some issues like safety or some very key, uh, yeah, key industries that you, that are very like, crucial for your own economy. You have to be very careful in the, in who you're working with. Uh, China has a, I mean, I, I sometimes I don't want to believe it, but I also hear from Dutch, uh, for example, especially the seed, like the, we're good in flowers and and, and, and and agriculture, and they told me that they they had uh, really spionage uh, people that stealing their ideas, which is of course. It's criminal, so you have to protect yourself for that. So you have to be very aware uh, what is going on. And um, but again, there are also other countries doing that. Uh, so it's not only China doing. So I sometimes I feel the word choice, even if I say infiltrating, like you're always expecting that only. I mean, if there's an image about uh, 
tourism, for example, we always get a picture of Chinese people walking around in Amsterdam. So it's always also the Chinese doing the things wrong. I'm not saying that they're not doing things wrong. It's very good that they're aware and that there are these reports also made in, in the Netherlands about what is exactly going on. I don't have a knowledge of all the reports, but I know that 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 the uh, general conclusion was that there, it's it's not it's not everywhere. It's it's been only like incidental. So you have to be. It's not that it's always happening in every sector. So it somehow affects the arts industry as well, but um, probably on a less uh, yeah less strong maybe than yeah. in other uh, other I sectors. I think it's more in a sort of certain sectors like uh, more in. Uh, uh, aircraft, uh, in this agriculture, there are some issues that I think uh, are serious. Okay, we're already at the end, so thank you so much for being with us, Monique. Well, thank you for your time, and I hope uh, that, um, yeah, it was okay to, that my, that my experience are uh, interesting enough for you. Absolutely. Thank you for the practical insights. Uh, very helpful for the overall discussion. Um, these three public events this week were contributing to the ongoing debate in Germany and Europe, and I hope we all keep the discussion going in the future. Thank you to IFA and Mercator um, Foundation for initiating, designing and hosting the discussion. Thank you also again uh, to our three presenters and the interesting insights they all shared with us. And last but not least, of course, also thank you to the organizers um, uh, in person and um, to all of you uh, for participating in the three or at least some of the online events that we had and also for your important contributions to the discussion, um, no matter whether you uh, asked questions in the chat or raised your hands. So thank you so much for that. Um, without you, it wouldn't have possible, of course, been possible. Um, and no audience, no questions, of course. So thank you so much. And please, again, keep the discussion going. Um, take the inspiration home with you into your organizations or institutions. For now and from my side, um, have a great day and enjoy the rest of the week. So bye bye and uh, Zeitian. <laughs>